CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Throughout history, down to the present, we have countless examples of groups of men, entire communities sometimes, living in a style unrelieved by more than a handful of women. Sometimes through choice, sometimes through necessity. Men in war, men in political office, men in certain occupations. But when the all-male community happens to be invaded by even a few members of the fairer sex, Strange and unexpected events often take place. It happened over 130 years ago in the state of California. Come closer to me, Ethan. I say it closer. Take my hands in yours. They're beautiful hands, aren't they? And my arms, so soft, so smooth. And look, I shake my hair free. I let my long black hair fall free upon my shoulders. Touch it, Ethan. It's like silk, isn't it? What's what's happened to me? Put your arms around me, Ethan. Hold me closer. Uh Closer. No, 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 I won't. You're not a human being. What kind of a devil are you? mystery drama, Flower of Evil, was suggested by the ancient Greek tragedy, Hippolytus of Euripides. It was written especially for the mystery theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Arnold Moss and Roberta Maxwell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. an exciting chapter of American history was being forged. Electrified by the news that nuggets of gold were lying loose, strewn over the rich earth of California, just waiting to be picked up, men swarmed west by the tens of thousands. It was a grand and gaudy adventure for a generation of brash young men, citizens of a brash young nation. For some few, like old Jethro Proctor... The adventure was not the only treasure he had sought. It is 1852. For the past three years, Jethro, with his son Ethan, has been patiently tearing out of the rocks and soil the precious yellow metal that lay buried in the mountains of the new state of California. The sky is darkening, Pa. Days are getting shorter fast. Yeah, that's so, Ethan. Autumn's coming in early this year. Yeah, a little stream's beginning to turn itself into a river once again. That's so, Sluggish trickle she's been giving us these late summer months will soon turn into a roaring torrent. Yeah, like last year. And the year before, remember. It's dark, Pa. It's time to quit. My legs are stiff from squatting in the ice cold of this water. You're young, Ethan. No reason to complain. My arms are nearly numb from swishing gravel in the pan. Well, so am I, but you don't hear no belly aching from me. Oh, of course not. you got a special hunger. Who knows when a big lump of gold will be sliding down that sluice. <laughs> Sad, you're a big, strong man. The endurance of a man that's half your age, everybody in the valley knows that. And you, you, my son, are young and soft. Like I always say, something just a little less than I always hoped for. I'm going up to the cabin. Five more minutes and we'll go together. We can't all of us be men of iron, Paul. Can't all of us be stallions. What's that supposed to mean? You know for certain what I mean. Now, look, we've been here over three years now. I've been working my back off, scraping a living, and it's been a good living out of the wilds of these here mountains. No one ever forced you to come out here in the first place. True, no one did. Nor did anyone force you. Could it be that maybe you didn't have the guts or the will to make up your own mind the way a the way a man makes up his mind? The way you made up your mind to sign your name to that letter a year ago? 
Well, now what are you talking about? That open letter in that back east newspaper. You do remember, don't you? What are you getting at? I remember nearly every word of it. When something like, um, wanted in California to 100 intelligent, virtuous, and efficient women, the undersigned are prepared to offer marriage in a good home together with $250 to cover the cost of the voyage to the golden state of California. And you were one of the signers. That's enough, Ethan. And then it said something like, Soil doves and ladies of the line need not apply. A testimonial from their local clergyman is desirable, though not absolutely necessary, and so on. Disgusting. Well, what was wrong with it? Well, maybe not for the others, but it was wrong for you. You killed one wife back east. You killed my mother. Oh, you're on that again. And now you're getting a second one. You'll probably kill her, too. Well, you... Don't you touch me! Jethro, you worked my poor mother to death. Like she was some kind of slave. And I will never forgive you. Never! You don't really care to have a wife. You just want someone to do your cooking and your cleaning and your fetching and your carrying and someone to keep you cozy in your warm little bed. And, of course, now you've got more than enough to pay for it. Maybe we better get back to the cabin. Not until you hear me out. Over a hundred simple women have answered that letter of yours and your friends. Over a hundred women have been traveling for almost a year, coming to this godforsaken end of the world, the flourishing shanty town of Grizzly Holler, just to fall into the loving arms of a bunch of sweating, unwashed, lonely miners. And some of them, lonely, old miners. They'll be getting here this week. We have word. Yeah. And you'll be getting yourself a wife again. Some nice old woman just as lonely as you. A woman you've never seen who's never seen you. You know nothing about her. She knows nothing about you. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, where did her letter say she's from? What'd she call herself? Her name's Drysdale. Amanita Drysdale. She's a widow. Amanita, now, ain't that just one beautiful name? She's from Massachusetts, a town called Salem. And there's one thing I, I want to warn you about. She... Oh, wait a minute. Wait just one blessed minute. What's the matter? It's dark. I can't be sure. Just, 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 just look here. Here, Ethan, in the wash pan. Do I see what I think I do? Huh. A gold nugget half as big as my fist. Oh, this is my lucky week. It's the biggest I ever seen. Boy, I want to shout out loud and dance for joy. Oh, shh, quiet. Hold everything. Up there. Look, where? Other side of the footbridge. Just above the trail to the cabin. That's old one eye, ain't it? No one else. Hand me my rifle, Ethan. Could never mistake that one. The biggest, blackest thief of a mountain cat anybody's ever seen in these parts. And that one ugly good eye of hers staring right at us. Yeah, that's her eye. This time, old one eye, you gonna get it. Right through that mean heart of yours. He's watching. She knows what you're up to. This is the last time you come prowling around here. She's getting ready to spring. Right at us. What happened? Too fast for me. She got away. Again? Oh, but she'll be back. You can count on it. They say it's bad luck to shoot at a mountain lion. <laughs> Only if you miss. Then women should be here in a minute now. I can't hardly wait. Hmm, trouble keeping my eyes off you, Pa. Hardly recognize you the way you do to yourself, huh? I look all right. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm nervous as a kitten. You think she'll take to me, Ethan? How could any woman resist? Matter of true fact, I really couldn't care less. Uh, just one thing. You? Yeah? I'm going going to be bone weary after her long voyage. You, you talk to her with kindness. Kindness? And you'll please to remember that Amanita's something besides my wife. Oh, you're telling me she's going to be my mother? Now, you just back up a minute there. Whatever yourself. you may be thinking about the lady and about me, you be sure to treat the woman with respect. You hear me? Complete respect. If she earns it, she'll get it. Oh, here they come. Around the bend. 
Now, this way, Mrs. Drysdale, whichever one of you ladies you happen to be, this way. Never did see such a bunch of over-anxious females. Look at them. Oh, lined up, waiting to be claimed by the happy bridegroom. I wonder which one's Amanita. They got their name tags pinned onto their shawls. That's, uh, Mrs. Sarah Simpson. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. Keep moving, keep moving. This one is, uh, Rebecca Goodbody. <laughs> well named, I'd say. Mm. Esther Attenbury. Rachel Hathaway. Mm. Take a look at this one here. With a shiny black hair and a beautiful smooth skin. Oh, she's a real beauty for... Mm-hmm. I'll be. That's your Amanita. Amanita Drysdale. Um, <clears throat> Mrs. Drysdale? That's right. Mr. Proctor? Good morning, ma'am. On behalf of my son and myself, I bid you a warm welcome to Grizzly Hollow. Can, can I offer you this bouquet as a small token of that welcome? How very sweet of you, Mr. Proctor. I thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And this, of course, is my son. How do you do? Oh, well, thank you, Mrs. Drysdale. And um, I was a little surprised. Surprised? How so? Well, I, I think my son expected you to be a little... Uh, more mature. I'm 27. Well, you didn't expect you to be quite so pretty. Is that how you imagine me, young man? <laughs> I don't think I gave it that much thought. Uh, you must be exhausted, Mrs. Drysdale. I confess I am a little tired. Uh, which of them piled up things is yours? Oh, they're jumbled up all with the others, I'm afraid. But they're all clearly labeled with my name. <laughs> As I am. Well, uh, I'll pick them out. You just wait for me here, and I won't be long. I like your father. Like it should be, Mrs. Drysdale. Not Mrs. Drysdale. I'm Anita. You know, I'm as much surprised at you as you said you were of me. Pleasantly surprised. There's not a doubt in my mind that we're going to get along wonderfully well. That'll be nice. Nice? Huh. Is that all you can say? Well, it's more important that you and my father get along. We will, of course. Why shouldn't we? The old fellow seems friendly enough, Mr. Proctor. Or may I call you Jethro? Jethro? Oh, uh, I'm not Jethro. What? I'm Ethan Proctor. Jethro's my father. Uh, the one you just called the old fella. You mean you're not the one who brought me here? He's the man I'm going to marry? That's it. He's old enough to be my... (sighs) Say it, say it, he is. And tomorrow morning, he's the one who's going to be your husband. I see. No matter what, you and I are going to be good friends. Real good friends, aren't we? Ethan? I reckon. Um, if... If you'll excuse me asking... Yes? That, uh... That shiny stone that's hanging on the gold chain around your neck... What of it? You've been fingering it ever since we met. Rubbing it around in your fingers. Uh, Can I ask why? It's a sort of good luck stone. Hmm. Changes to different colors when you move. Orange, blue, green, gold. It's called a cat's eye. Belonged to my great-grandmother many, many years ago. In Massachusetts. Odd-looking thing. Tell you a secret, Ethan. It's more than a good luck piece. It can make funny things happen. Things that couldn't happen without it. Like what? Just be friendly, Ethan. Sooner or later, you may just find out. of the protective amulet goes back to the most primitive societies. The rabbit's foot, the piece of twisted red coral, the claw of a bird or animal. Its purpose, to avert danger, to thwart the forces of evil. But some of these objects are believed to possess the magical powers of malevolence, a supernatural force that serves as a tool of destruction, even death. 
I shall return shortly with Act Two. By the year 1852, the records tell us, over 100,000 gold-hungry miners from every corner of the earth had thronged to California and had managed to wrest over $81 million worth of the precious metal out of the rich hills. For most of these men, life was hard and lonely, entirely male communities, until some of them had the bright idea of advertising for wives and bringing them west, as Jethro Proctor has done with Amanita Drysdale. What do you use these wash pans for, Mr. Proctor? Oh, just about everything. For pan and the gravel that comes sliding down the sluices. For feeding the mule. For frying our breakfast bacon. The same pan? Uh-huh. That's the first thing we'll have to change. I'm not frying any bacon in the same pan you feed your mule out of. Well, I'll buy a couple of new ones down at the store in Devil's Camp. That's only the beginning. We're low on flour, sugar, pork, molasses, coffee, tea. You can do with a new flannel shirt or two. The medicine chest needs refilling, and some pretty curtains for the window. You know, they're the only genuine glass windows for miles around. And we're going to need two new mattresses. One for us, and one for poor Ethan. No human being should be asked to sleep on lumpy mattresses like these. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? Oh, it's kind of funny. Me and Ethan's been getting along all this time, never knowing we was what you might call... Unfortunate. But you're perfectly right, Mrs. Proctor. The shack is yours now. You do just what you want to purdy it up. Thank you, Mr. Proctor. The first thing I'd like to do is to change some of the furniture around. Your home? I'd like the table put near the window. More light that way. Whatever you say. Now, as to the bed... I, uh, I was thinking we could put Ethan's bunk out in the tool shed. It'd make a little more room for us, and at the same time, give us a little more the feeling of, uh, of being alone by ourselves. Oh, that would be cruel, putting the poor boy out there in the shed. Oh, he wouldn't mind one bit. No, Mr. Proctor. I suppose not. And may I ask just one little thing from you, my beautiful young wife? What would that be, Mr. Proctor? You think one of these days you might get round to calling me Jethro? Come in, Ethan. Come in. Where's my father? Left half an hour ago for Devil's Camp with the wagon and mule. Gone for supplies. Uh, can I fix you something to eat? Ain't hungry. Sure. Sure. Jethro won't be back till late tonight. You going to the games and dance on Sunday? Maybe. You going to be in the game? I don't know. I look forward to dancing with you. <clears throat> Tell me something, Ethan. Why do you resent me? What have you got against... against me? Perfect stranger. Coming out of nowhere. Marrying my father, trying to take my mother's place. Not you, nor nobody else is going to do that. Nobody wants to. But I am your father's wife. Oh, no, you got no real feeling for him. I know that. Jethro wasn't quite honest when he wrote that letter to me. He led me to think he was a much younger man. Young and strong and handsome. Like you. So, here I am. Married to someone who's more than twice my age. Yeah, Manita, and... there's no big love lost between me and my father. You know that. But as long as you're going to share this place... Share? You... Just a minute, Ethan. I don't share anything. I don't have to. You don't? You're going to have to realize that this is my place, not yours. My home, my kitchen, my dishes. But my father's bed. To that, he's welcome. He's paid for it. What kind of a woman are you? The way you see it, sooner or later, everything he has is going to be yours. Is that it? It could be ours. Now listen to me, Ethan. Come closer. I said... Closer. That's better. Much better. Keep your eyes right here on this stone. The cat's eye that's hanging from my neck. Take my hand in yours. They're beautiful hands, aren't they? 
and my arms, so soft, so smooth. And look, I shoot my hair free. I let my long black hair fall free from my shoulders, almost to my waist. Touch it, Ethan. It's like silk, isn't it? Caress it. What? What, what's happening to me? Put your arms around me, Ethan. Hold me closer. No. Closer. No, 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 I... I won't. What, what, what are you doing to me? What kind of devil are you? I am mighty among men. They honor me with many names. All those that live and see the light of sun are mine to rule. I am all powerful in the kingdom of darkness. My will is Satan's will. Together, we rule supreme. We'll see. What are you doing, you fool? I'm carrying that cursed charm from off your neck. Give that back to me, Ethan. Give that back to me. There it is. Don't turn away from me, Ethan. I want your love. I mean to have it. You are my father's wife. I owe him nothing. I've been in love with you ever since I got here. Don't. Don't touch me. Now, you, you stay away from me. I can make you love me. What are you? Who are you? Do I frighten you? How, how'd you get here? Where are you really from? Oh, the air in this here cabin is foul with the smell of evil. I'm going out where I can breathe. You'll be back, Ethan. And I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> Gents and ladies, we come to the main event of this here Sunday wing day. And today we got something a little special for you. Wrestling contest of fathers against their own sons. Now, for, uh, for the first contest, one of our recent blushing bridegrooms, Jethro Proctor, is going to match his strength and skill with those of that fine upstanding lad of his, Ethan Proctor. Uh, gents? You both ready? Then go to it and may the best man win. Proctor, may I sit next to you? <laughs> I'd be honored, man, to have such a pretty young thing. Wait, you get your Proctor's bride, ain't you? Yes, I'm Amanita Proctor. <laughs> Most happy to have you join me, Miss Rogers. <laughs> Look at them two fellas go at it. The uh, the crowd betting on the old boy. Oh, begging your pardon, man. I mean, this first one. <laughs> oh, it looks like Jethro might be getting the best of the boy. Is he indeed? Hey, just look. He's got the boy's shoulders no more than a couple of inches from the ground. Maybe that could change. How's that, man? Uh, nothing, Mr. McCoster. Nothing. My will is taken home through. Together, we rule supreme. Oh, what happened? Why have they stopped wrestling? Well, it looks like there might have been a little accident. They're they, they sending for the doctor. Oh, what seems to be wrong? Well, the match is over. Jethro's hurt. Looks like his arm's been twisted clear out of his socket. He, his arm is broke. It's clean broke. Oh, what a dreadful thing to happen, Mr. McCloskey. Isn't it? <laughs> the sun will be down in half an hour, Ethan. Where have you been all day? Why? Just curious. I felt so bad about what happened at the game this morning, I just took off. Get my mind off it. You couldn't help it, Ethan. Went fishing all day with Pete McCloskey. How's my father doing? Fell asleep on the bunk. He can use the rest. Hmm. Was the doc here? Yes. He said it might be quite a while before Jeffrey can use his arm again. Hmm. It was all my fault. I don't know how it happened. Don't be too sure. Well, of course it was my fault. But you didn't do it on purpose. Yeah, that's what I keep telling myself. You didn't. I know. How could you know? I'll let you in on a little secret. How are you just know it? 
Now, why are you fingering that little thing around your neck again? You had nothing to do with what happened to your father. Nothing at all. All right, I didn't. Well, then who did? You? Maybe. Maybe I caused the whole thing. Yeah. How, how could you? I can make a lot of things happen when I want to. Ethan, you ever hear of a plant called Amanita? A plant? It's a kind of mushroom. It's snowy white, perfectly formed and dazzling in its beauty. What about it? The Amanita is among the most poisonous plants that grow upon the surface of the earth. The deadliest. Mistake it for an innocent mushroom, eat it, and in no time, you die. An agonizing death. Why are you telling me this? Just listen. By some, it's called the flower of evil, cup of death, destroying angel. All of them, most unpleasant names. But to others, the name means beloved, little sweetheart. What would your choice be? Amanita, flower of evil, or Amanita, my beloved? I, I couldn't care less about either one of them. I'm going to leave this place for good and stay away. A thousand miles away as long as you're still here. But not before my father learns the truth about you, because you are an evil woman. He'll listen to me before he ever listens to you. So you can save your breath. Ethan, look at me. I'm going. Stop fighting me. Don't force me to do something we could both regret. You keep away from me, you witch. You keep away. Oh! You slapped me. You'll be sorry for that, Ethan. Very sorry. Mark my word. We'll see. What did you just call me? I called you a witch, and that's what you are. You're right, Ethan. A witch. As my mother was before me. And her dead mother before her. And her mother's dead mother before her. An angry mob burned her to ashes over a hundred years ago in Salem. Well, they should have done the same to you. It was a black day that brought you to these hills. A black day when you come to my father's marriage bed. Maybe he doesn't see it that way. Anyway, here I am. And here I mean to stay. Oh, what's that? That's old one eye. One eye? Look at her up there. Glaring down at us with her one mean eye. She seems so fear. She's as dangerous a cat as they come. And black as the night. Now, now, now. Don't move. She been here long? She showed first time a year ago, Christmas Day. Been killing chickens, sheep, dogs ever since. <laughs> Sometimes just for the fun of it. Christmas Day? The same day I left for here. What are you doing, Ethan? My gun is pointed right at her. And I won't miss, I can tell you. Let me see. Why'd you do that? Why'd you knock the gun out of my hand? Why? You surely wouldn't want to harm a beautiful creature like that. Or would you? It was once written that heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell... A fury like a woman scorned. And if that woman should happen to believe she has the gift of supernatural powers, powers that go beyond those of ordinary mortal men and women, not only can that fury be unbounded, it can lead to unexpected, even terrifying ends. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. mountain lion, sometimes called a puma, is a graceful, slender animal, often measuring as much as seven feet in length. With his cold, calculating eyes, it shows its face in every type of country, on mountaintops, in grasslands, in deserts, and in forests. It's a solitary hunter that preys on livestock and other animals up to the size of a deer. Usually, it avoids contact with humans. But old one-eye of our story seems to be unique. In its blackness, in its blinded one eye, and in its evil power to destroy. Why'd you do that? Why'd you knock the gun out of my hand? Why? 
You surely wouldn't want to harm a beautiful creature like that. Oh, would you? You tell my father I'll be back before dark. Be careful, Ethan. Watch where you're going. Why, you planning to weave one of them foul spells of yours over me? Or, or maybe doing away with me altogether? What a strange idea. You take credit for Jethro's broken arm. Why not for my life? If that's what was in my mind. I'm clever enough to find someone to do it for me. So watch your step. Especially on the narrow footbridge. It's become dangerous. I'm going in now to have a little talk with your father. About what? About you. I see you're up, Jethro. How are you feeling? Oh, so so. I I found it hard sleeping on my back. Can I fix you some supper? No, no, not right away. I'm not all that hungry. Where you been? Outside. Didn't I hear a shot? Must have been Ethan. Said he was after squirrels. You still outside? I wouldn't know. He uh, told me to tell you he'd be back before dark. What's the matter with you, Avenida? You, you seem edgy and upset. I am. Well, what's wrong? Strange boy. That son of yours. Oh, I know he can be real moody sometimes, just like his mother. That's not what I'm talking about. Well, then what are you talking about? I can understand what made him do it, but... Just the same. Do, do what? He's young. A lot of things are bothering him. He's, he's got no woman of his own. Go on. I think you can make him listen to reason, Jethro. I wouldn't be telling you all this, except I... I can't face it alone. And if it should ever happen again... What happened? Well, speak up. It was unusually hot this afternoon. Indian summer, I think you call it. Well, while you were resting, I decided to go down to that big boulder at the edge of the river, downstream to bathe. I spread my clothes on the rock's warm top and started to dip into the fresh, cool water. Yes? Suddenly, from out of nowhere, he appeared. Ethan. He started coming toward me. His, his face was red, his eyes like some maddened animal. I'd never seen anything like it. Then he came to the water's edge, pointed his rifle at me, and ordered me out of the water. I'm listening, Amanita. And then... I can't it. What happened then? He took me in his arms. Put his mouth on my nose. I can't. Oh, my, my poor darling. I kept telling him, I'm Jethro's wife. I'm your father's wife. You can't do this to me. You mustn't. And he? He didn't listen. He kept on saying that you were a tired old man, that you killed his mother, that you couldn't appreciate me the way he could. When did you say all this happened? This afternoon, after the game. This afternoon. That boy is going to regret he ever saw the light of day. If what you say is true... Would a woman lie about a thing like this? I'll kill him, I swear, if what you say is so. That this will be the last day he ever spends on Earth. Oh, I... I hate her. Everything about her. Jeff will soon find out the kind of woman he's taken for a bride. She is so full of tricks. Tricks of the devil that she uses. She loves that little stone between her fingers. And she moves. Now, 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 watch where you put your feet, Ethan. Oh, my, this little bridge is shaky. Hmm, slippery. Look at that. The rain is swirling the river, swirling around like some mad dog. It's My foot's slipping. Yeah, you grab the hand rope. Yeah. No, no, the, the whole bridge is collapsing. It's, it's breaking right in two. Uh, somebody help me. Help, help, help. Here, 
Jethro. Let me plant this pillow right behind you. I, I just can't sleep. I know. You're thinking about Ethan. It's not like him to go off without a word, stay out all night. Boy, has never done a thing like this before. I, I, I wonder where he did go. Jethro, last night you were ready to take Ethan's life into your hands. For what he'd done to me in the afternoon, you swore this would be the last day he'd ever spend alive. That's what I said, if you were telling the truth. You're worried about him, aren't you? Worried about your good-for-nothing evil son. A son who thinks his father so much dirt to be trampled on. A miserable boy who despises you. You, his father. I don't want to hear no more, Amanita. Blood is thicker than water, isn't it? As far as you're concerned, Ethan can do just about anything he wants, including putting me to shame. Amanita, I warn you. If you want to share your wife with your son, say so. If that's the way you want it, it'll be all right with me. Hold your tongue. Don't you dare speak to me that way. Nobody ever speaks to me like that. Don't you ever again. Here's you. Here's this, Roger. Open the door. Keep the glasses. What are you doing here at this hour? Miss Mr. McCloskey, what brings you here? I, uh, got bad news for you, Jethro. Well, what is it? It's Ethan. Two of the boys just found his body down near Feather River, all crushed and battered. Oh, what are you, what are you saying, Pete? Ethan, young Ethan, your son, he's dead. Drowned and, and carried down river in the boiling, crashing rapids. He uh, must have been crossing your footbridge and give way. Footbridge? You see for yourself, as soon as it gets light, looks like it's split in two. The, the ropes that held it in place must have been frayed. Uh, must have just give way. I'm sorry, Jethro. I'm mighty sorry. Thank you, Pete. Thank you for letting us know. The uh, boys are bringing the body back for proper burial. Thank you. Mm. And only yesterday... The two of us, Ethan and me, we spent the whole afternoon together. Wait a minute. Did you say yesterday afternoon? Yeah, after your arm got broke. <laughs> Came to my shanty, mighty upset. Said he'd like to get away from everybody for a couple of hours. It took him fishing. And when, when exactly was this, Pete? Well, yesterday afternoon. We fished till it was almost dark. You mean the two of you spent the whole afternoon together, just just the two of you? The whole afternoon, yeah. Thank you again, Pete. I'm much obliged for everything. Well, I'm sorry to be the bearer of such sad news. Now, if I can be of any help, you, you just let me know. I'm Anita. Yes? You, you heard what old Pete said. I heard. Ethan's been drowned. That ain't what I mean. Pete and Ethan spent the whole afternoon together yesterday fishing. The whole afternoon. What of it? McCluskey would have no reason on earth to lie to invent a thing like that, would he? What are you getting at, old man? The truth, Amanita, the truth. You told me you went bathing yesterday afternoon... That Ethan come upon you unawares, made you come out of the water, and like some animal, so you said, he took you in his arms and kissed you. Ain't that what you told me, Amanita? But that ain't what happened, is it? Matter of fact, it didn't happen at all. Because Ethan was never there with you. He was with Pete McCloskey the whole afternoon. McCloskey's a liar. You made the whole thing up, didn't you? Just so as to give me a reason... For wanting to kill Ethan. I told you the truth. I didn't have to kill him, even if I'd had good reason. Because you did. How could I? The ropes on that flimsy bridge of yours just came apart. He fell into the river. He drowned. McCloskey said so. That's what you'd like to have me think. It's the truth. No, it ain't the truth. Because I know who you are, my beloved. I know what you are. Yesterday, when you were having words with Ethan, you told him you were a witch, like in the old days. I was behind the door. I heard every word you said, every single word. What do you plan to do about it? You murdered my son, Amanita, with your spells, just as sure as if you put a bullet through his head. Son was worthless. He was no man, not even the excuse for a man that you are. He was my son. 
Now, first things first. This evil little charm of yours will be lost forever in the waters of the river. The river where Ethan lost his life. And then? I need time to think. And while I take that time, I'm going to keep you locked up here in this shack where you can't do any more harm. I'm going to bar every window, lock every door from the outside. It'll give you time to think, too. You can't do that to me. Don't you try to stop me. Go ahead. Lock me in. You can't hurt me, Jethro. I'm strong. Stronger than both of you. You and your son, both weak and useless. You hear me, old man? I'm stronger. Stronger. May the hot fires of hell burn you and your house to a crisp. Bury you in ashes. Here. I fling this burning lamp after you against your bolted door. See how the flames begin to rise. May they light your way to hell, old man. Do you hear me? To hell! that I brought into my house. Only fire can cleanse it of wickedness. Ethan, my son, I am ready now for the darkness of the earth. I wish to live no more. No more. Orange flames lick their way around the gold miner's shanty. Nothing is left but a pile of smoking embers. No trace remains of anything that was ever in the house. Jethro Proctor turns his back on the still glowing pile, walks off, his head bowed, with the measured steps of a man more dead than alive. Into the light of the rising sun, into the light of another day. I'll be back shortly. In 428 B.C., more than 2,400 years ago, the great tragic playwright Euripides, famous in his own lifetime for his dramatizations of the violent passions of men and women, wrote the tragedy Hippolytus. It has remained one of the world's great masterpieces of the struggle between the forces of good and evil. The story you have just heard, Flower of Evil, was suggested by Hippolytus. The same drama that was the inspiration of our own Eugene O'Neill's Desire Under the Elms. Our cast included Arnold Moss, Roberta Maxwell, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.